Now, today we're going to continue the short series that I've been in entitled Rescue. Aren't you glad, this is number three, aren't you glad God's in the rescue business? We'd all, we'd all be in a world of hurt if he wasn't a rescuer, you know, because this is what the Bible is all about. From the front of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's about rescue. God in, uh, institutes a plan to recover humanity from their own ignorance, their own rebellion, their own faulty decision-making. And he's never lifted that plan of rescue. Down through the ages, the Bible is a testimony of all of the different ways God has rescued his children and humanity in general to the extent they will cooperate with his rescue effort. And so God is a rescuer from the front of the book to the back of the book. That's what it's about. And most all of you, all of you, not most all of you, all of you uh, can recall dozens and dozens of times that God has rescued your sorry self. Amen. From your decisions, your ignorance, your rebellion, from whatever it may have been. And I'm certainly speaking to myself when I say sorry self. You know, it's like, because most of the time, we don't give God credit. You think back on your life. Whew, boy, I sure lucked out then, man. You know, wow. I got, I got away with that one. I didn't get what I, I could have gotten, you know. But we, you know, in our earlier uh, times of life, and especially before we're saved, we don't give God the credit for rescue. But your life has been a tapestry of being rescued from your stuff. Amen. 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 And so we can all identify with the fact that God is a rescuer. I mean, Jesus came to do what? Set the captive free. That's his whole purpose in coming. This was to be the ultimate rescue once and for all from the authority of darkness in our life. And he came to set the captive free. What does captive mean? Captive, this is my definition, not Webster's, so don't look it up. But it's a better definition than Webster's. My definition is imprisoned circumstantially against your will and the will of God. That's what captivity is, imprisoned circumstantially. Could be a physical infirmity, a circumstance involving money, insufficiency, lack, whatever the case may be, uh, any different kind of circumstance that you can't get beyond. You're held there. Doesn't matter what you do, you don't know what to do, and if you did know, thought you knew what to do, it wouldn't work. You're held there against your will, and as you see in the Word, the will of God. And Jesus came to set the captive free. That's what this life is about. That's what the message of the Bible is all about. And so, you know, the first kind of rescue that we have to choose, because basically you have to choose to be rescued. I mean, God doesn't impose rescue on anybody. Now, this is the normal operation of, of His grace, we appropriate it by faith. And before you're saved and don't know any better, He'll rescue you dozens of times. Even after you're saved and still know a little because you didn't go to church like you should, He will still rescue you dozens of times. That's the extension of His mercy. But He says you are to live by faith. That's what He ultimately wants. And so you have to learn that He is in the rescue business. You need to know that you need a rescue and that he is in the rescue business, and then choose to be rescued, to cooperate with him. You have to choose to be rescued. It's not the will of God that any should perish, but he doesn't force anyone to get saved. He says, I place before you this day life and blessing, death and cursing. You choose. You have to choose to be rescued. And the first rescue that we have to choose is the biggie. That is translation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. And this was our basic text for Easter. Why don't we look there now and just refresh our memories for a moment. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who, talking about God, hath delivered. Past tense, already done. He's provided the rescue You've just got to jump on board. 
hath delivered, the word delivered is defined as rescue in the Strong's, hath delivered or rescued us from the power, the Greek word is exousia, it actually means authority of darkness. This is important because if you have the idea that you get saved or you get rescued uh, from the kingdom of darkness, then nothing bad's ever going to happen to you again. You'll be very sorely disappointed. You live in a world that is governed by darkness. The Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. He's referred to in a different translation uh, as the um, kingdom. It is his kingdom that's referred to here, the kingdom of Satan. It's the living translation that says, rescued from the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom. And so essentially, this world is governed, this natural world, is governed by the kingdom of darkness. Every person is born into, uh, by default, the kingdom of darkness. Because in Adam, all men die. Spiritual death is a fact of humanity's present condition until they make a decision to be rescued. So you're born into the kingdom of darkness. And this is the Bible. This, don't get aggravated with me. I told somebody one time their father was the devil. I thought he was going to take a swing at me. But that was just, that was just a fact. That's, that's the way the Bible represents it. And so essentially, we have to make the choice once we know we need to be rescued from the authority of darkness, not the touch of darkness. You live in a world that's governed by darkness. Jesus said there's tribulation in the world. You live in the world, but be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. In Christ, you've overcome the world. And so what you've been delivered from is the authority of this world system, the authority of the cursing and death that darkness has to offer. That realm no longer has authority over you when you've been translated to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Now you got to know that. There are a lot of people that still live under the thumb of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, even though they've been delivered from it, they don't know they have, that kingdom no longer has authority over them, so they don't exercise their rights and their privileges. But this is the first rescue any of us have to opt for. And we know that the vehicle of that rescue, as in my case in Southeast Asia, it's not a helicopter. It is the blood of Jesus which provides forgiveness of sin. Sin being our rejection of God. You reject God either consciously or through the rejection of his word because God and his word are one. That's what sin is, a rejection of God. And so forgiveness is tendered so we can be translated, changed to another kingdom and live under the authority of God Almighty as opposed to the authority of of the God of this world, who is Satan. And this is the first, first rescue we all need. But the truth of the matter is, even after you've been translated from one kingdom to another, been rescued from the authority of darkness, you'll need rescues throughout your Christian life. It isn't a, it isn't a failure for you to have to be rescued circumstantially from something you can't manage after you're saved. I mean, we always tend to say, Lord, why am I in this box? What did I do? You know, we, we take it on ourselves. Well, a lot of times you didn't do a thing except be born again. You become the enemy of the kingdom of darkness, Satan's enemy. You represent a piece of the unfolding will of God in the earth, and he's going to resist that any way that he possibly can. So it may be you didn't do a thing except become a believer. And then, you know, circumstance seems to be lined up against you in one way or another. The devil, according to James 1, is putting pressure on what you believe to hopefully, from his point of view, push you back into the secular arena. At any rate, uh, that's not where I'm going with this. The purpose of this message today is to talk about how we cooperate with the rescues that God sends our way, because you will need them. 
during the course of your life on this earth. Darkness touches you, either because you just, you know, you're just part of the will of unfolding will of God, and He's going to resist that any way He can, or if it's because you made a dumb mistake. You know, your ignorance got you in trouble, or your rebellious carnal nature got you in trouble. You're going to need a rescue from time to time after you're a believer. Probably more than you would like to acknowledge you need to be rescued. Well, I'm going to assume for the purposes of today's message that you understand you need to be rescued because um, you're not smart enough, cool enough, good looking enough to do it yourself. You need to be rescued. And secondly, that it's the will of God that you be rescued. We're going to talk about the arena of physical health today. Healing from sickness and disease or infirmity. You know, next time we're going to talk about poverty and lack, insufficiency, the captivity that a lot of people find themselves in financially to unemployment or a job that is inadequate or that they don't want to be involved in, some sort of financial captivity. Today, we're talking about the kind of captivity defined by sickness, disease, and infirmity. And what you do to cooperate with God's efforts to rescue you. Essentially, as I said, I'm going to begin with the assumption that you understand you need to be rescued and that God is in the rescue business. That it's His will that you not be sick or diseased. And a lot, of, a lot of the body of Christ is still confused about this. Do you realize how much in the minority we are? You know, that's something that shocks me every time I com- I'm confronted with it. But anytime I do something ecumenical and, in, and interact with other clergy, I, I, I am reminded, my gosh, I'm the only one out of this room full of of clergy that believes God is a good God, that he doesn't use sickness and disease to teach you a lesson. But this is what the Bible says. He's not in the sickness business. That's the touch of death. There is no death in God. He is life and blessing. And he says it's his will that you walk free of sickness and disease. He said by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. Healing is in the atonement. It's been done. You're not asking, begging God to heal you. You are, healing has already been provided. So I'm going to assume that you know that. That God is in the rescue business. You need a rescue. He's in the rescue business. He provides deliverance, rescue, from sickness and disease and infirmity of every sort. So why doesn't it come for a lot of believers? It's because they don't know how to cooperate with God's chosen methodology. They don't know how to cooperate with the rescue he has extended. And just as I shared regarding my time in Southeast Asia as as a pilot, we were trained in, you know, air sea rescue, jungle rescue, but you had to, you needed to be able to cooperate with. We were trained because you needed to know how it was going to come, what it looked like, and what your responsibility is. Now, there were occasions that um, a third party had to become involved. They would, they would lower a pair of rescue specialists if the pilot was injured on ejection and couldn't help himself, they would lower somebody down there to help him. But basically, you had to do it yourself. And you had to know what to do. And the same principle is true in our relationship with, with God. He's not going to force anything on you. You need to know what to look for and how to cooperate with it. And so that's what I want to talk about today. How do you cooperate with the rescues that God sends your way to bring you out of sickness, disease, or infirmity? How do you cooperate with that? And enhance not only the success of the rescue, but even the timing. And it be something a little more... um, quickly than, you know, it could otherwise be. So then, okay, so the first thing that I want to say about our cooperative effort and the rescues that God sends our way is you have to be honest with yourself whether or not your behavior contributed to your captivity. 
and then make some changes. If your behavior contributed to your captivity, the need for your rescue, God's still going to extend a rescue to you. If you blew it, did something wrong, even knowing you shouldn't have done it. He's not, he's not going to withhold rescue from you. But you can't, you can't engage in that process until you accept responsibility for your own contribution to your situation and then make a change. And this should be fairly self-evident, but a lot of people, man, they just, they just, they blame Schiff. Well, this was his fault, her fault, God, you know, God's fault. I mean, we, we blame a lot of other people. But until we take responsibility for the things that we need to change, then a lot of rescues are going to pass us by. And so again, uh, even though uh, this is self, rather self-evident, we'll talk about some of these things like healing. You know, uh, if you've got lung cancer because you've smoked for 30 years and you're believing God for healing, then I would suggest you quit smoking. Amen. Amen. And, and even though that seems a little bit simplistic, I've, I've, I have prayed for people that had lung cancer or emphysema, God healed them. I mean, dramatically. And in two instances, they never quit smoking, and within a couple of years, they were dead. You want to hold on to your healing, God will bring it. He's no respect to a person. You believe for it. You position yourself for it. He'll bring it. But how many times do I hear somebody say, well, I got healed, but, but I lost it. Or, you know, it came back on me, whatever it might have been. Well, I would suggest it probably has to do with a failure to change the behavior that opened you to that form of captivity to begin with. So the first thing you do to cooperate with the rescues that God sends your way is take a look at your lifestyle choices. And the first thing you might look toward are substances that are abused, meaning substances that, that people ingest physically that weren't intended by God for human consumption. Now, tobacco was never intended by God to be smoked, chewed, or otherwise. You know, uh, but we did that. The cocoa plant was never intended by God uh, to be a source of one of the most uh, devastatingly addictive drugs that's ever been known to man, cocaine, heroin. The poppy was never meant to produce that kind of addictive hallucinogenic in its own right uh, drug that has destroyed so many lives. The fruit of the vine was never intended to be a source of celebratory uh, I mean, you know, something you use to celebrate because you can get drunk. You can get loose as a goose and be somebody that you can't be because you're too uptight when you're not drunk. Or whatever. Alcohol. Tobacco, alcohol, drugs. Uh, how much do I talk about this stuff? Uh, okay, I've said enough about tobacco. That is really simplistic. But drugs... You know, we think of the hard drugs. It also has to do with things that are seemingly innocent. Prescription drugs, cross-the-counter drugs, you know, painkillers of various sorts. You can get addicted to Advil. You know, if, if you take it enough, if you work at it. You know, if you just absolutely can't use your faith to get rid or get through a, a, some kind of pain, you know, I've had people say, well, the small on my back is, you know, I, I can't get rid of the pain. The only way I can stand it is to take Advil. And you, you know, you take a look at them, you know why the small of their back is certain, because they got a pot sticking out here. And they're obese, you know. One problem leads to another. I'm, I'm serious now. I'm not interested in condemning anybody. I want you to face some stuff. Because, you know, there's no point and laying it all on God and saying, Lord, I'm believing you for healing, but you don't cooperate with him at all. You don't make choices that are going to enable that rescue to become apparent or to be manifest, then, hey, it's, you're going to be frustrated in your Christianity. 
And so essentially, uh, you know, I mean, I know people that are addicted to, what do they call it, Advil PM, Tylenol PM, they can't sleep without it. You know, there are people that, I mean, does that mean it's bad to take Advil? No. I mean, you got a headache every now and then, take one or two or whatever. You know, just don't let it become a pattern. Because whether it's ibuprofen or acetaminophen, all of these painkillers have a huge impact on the liver. And it will produce cirrhosis of the liver just as surely as overindulgence in alcohol will. And so you just need to be mindful of, of these things. They're opening doors to problems that you don't need to open. So cigarettes, drugs, you know, alcohol. Oh, here we go now. Alcohol. You know, a lot of the body of Christ falls under the category of sipping saints. You know, and they say to themselves, well, it's okay for me to have a couple of glasses of wine, you know, uh, before dinner. I, in moderation, it's okay. And didn't Jesus, you know, he, he made wine, turned water into wine for a wedding celebration. Well, come on, do you think the Lord is going to provide uh, the resource to get everybody at the party plastered, drunk, <laughs> knee-walking, drunk? Oh, come on. You know, there were two ways to produce what is referred to as wine. Wine just means fruit of the vine. Some of it was fermented, some of it was not. It was grape juice. What do you suppose the Lord, what do you suppose he made? Is he going to provide a substance that will, over hundreds of years, destroy billions of lives? Alcohol has destroyed more lives than any other substance abuse there is. Is the Lord going to just allow you to play with that and celebrate with that and go out and get blasted every now and then? Of course not. So is it not all right to have a glass of wine every now and then? That's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to tell you that. You know, but consider your motivation. Why do you want that glass of wine, those two glasses, those two beers, that drink in the afternoon? Most people will tell you, if they're honest, well, it just helps me relax. It helps me feel better. It's been a rough day. You know, I can get a little peace this way. It helps, helps settle me down. Should the alcohol be doing that, or should the Lord be doing that? I mean, your rest, your peace, your joy is not intended to come in the counterfeit of a bottle of wine. You know, God didn't, didn't endorse that approach to our life. So the bottom line is this. Most people who drink even moderately do so because they like the buzz. <laughs> the buzz. The buzz makes me feel better, makes me better able to accommodate the stresses of the day. Just be honest with yourself. Because it is the beginning. You, you, you may have been able to drink moderately for 10 years. Never get really high. Never been problematic. But you can't help but wonder during those 10 years how many people you became a stumbling block to who couldn't handle it. But statistics show that over a long period of time, every person who is given to alcoholic consumption will increase their consumption. And so you're opening the door to a devil you do not want to let in. Amen. And of course, the, uh, the effect, the impact on your life is far more negative than, than uh, the potential impact than you would ever want to make room for. So, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, caffeine. Mmm, caffeine. Mmm. <laughs> caffeine. Let me just say this about caffeine. Listen, uh, you know, I'm not talking to you from, you know, some little ivory tower up here. Most of these things I have learned about some of them the hard way. 
Caffeine, I mean, we used to get up for a morning brief. This is where it started for me in Vietnam before a mission, you know, at 3.30 in the morning. And everybody in the briefing room drank as much coffee as they could get down. You know, uh, the, the jolt, the, the need to be alert, I don't know. It was just the thing. And I never stopped until fairly recently. I'm not going to tell you how recently, but fairly recently. <laughs> I drank on average a pot a day. Well, I, well, I did. It's, come on, don't say that. <laughs> I'm just trying to level with you. But essentially, essentially, you know, it was, it was, it was two, two, two big cups. Harley cups. They were big cups. <laughs> Maybe three. Sometimes three quarters of a pot, sometimes a pot. That's what I would drink. And good, I've done it for 50 years. And the Lord convicted me of this. Not quite 50, but close. The Lord convicted me of this a while back. Uh, I read an article about, you know, um, hey, you know, caffeine will, uh, consumption in general will elevate a person's heart rate by 10 beats a minute. Now, you consider 10 beats a minute over the span of a lifetime. You have worked your heart far, far harder. Now, you, you're young, okay. You, know, you get to be as ancient as I am. You start considering, you know, putting as little wear and tear on this deal as I possibly can. But I read about that, and then so, you know, I went off coffee. And when you do... You know, your body is chemically, your body's chemistry has accommodated that caffeine for decades, and now all of a sudden it doesn't have it. The chemistry has to change back. I went through all sorts of little weird deals. I'm talking, I never had a headache in my life, and I started getting headaches, and, you know, my immune system became compromised, and I, I don't know. It took a while for things to level out, but you needed to do it. I needed to do it. Before we go, I want to take a moment to thank our ministry partners for their support. I'm so grateful for their willingness to help us continue spreading God's Word to the world. If you'd like to join our team, visit our website for more information. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Tune in again soon, and until then, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.